Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to the YouTube channel. We are documenting my whole off season leading up to Olympia. We're now on volume four for the off season. So you haven't caught the last videos. Um, go back, watch them, get you up to date on how I've been progressing throughout the off season. Going over all updates, changes, and then going into some training for you guys. So uh, this will be my 19th week into off season. And uh, not a lot has changed as far as with it, within my diet, but from a physique standpoint, but it's just kind of slowly just keeping to make, make progress. So that, that last video update that y'all saw, I was around 236. And I'd been around that for, for a while. And then these last few weeks, the body weight's been progressing up pretty slowly. I was coming off a deload uh, those last time that we talked. So this last bit of training has uh, been really productive. Um, I did have that issue in my pec minor is what I found out that this little uh, tweak was in. And so that had limited my training over these past few weeks. I was doing some rehab work throughout this whole phase with uh, the modern movement, Justin Reyna. He's my rehab specialist and he's been phenomenal. So we've been really assessing and getting down to like, what's the root issue here in, in my physique and why do I have these issues coming up? and there's a few factors that go into it, but uh, a lot of it's like, for, for one, um, lifestyle factors. Uh, and I think that is the biggest driver for most of us, how you just work during the day, what kind of position you're naturally in throughout the day. And for me, I'm usually working here at the computer desk. Um, it's easy to slouch over. It's easy to flex the thoracic spine and stay internally rotated. And then you try to go in, in the gym and get into this thoracic extension and externally rotated. And it's so easy to set yourself up for, for injuries and have compensations happening and that lack of mobility occurring. So if that's for one, then also sleeping mechanics, like how I sleep at night in your bed. Not so like if you have the right bed, it, it could just be like how you position yourself in bed um, isn't ideal for what you need for, for spinal health. So I think these are some of the issues. Um, also just training over time stuff gets just beat up and having that lack of thoracic extension also has led to lack of uh, scapula mobility. So my scaps aren't rotating out how they should be. And when that's not happening, you're not going to have a lot of mobility at the shoulder joint, which if you're trying to do like an overhead press, you can force yourself into that position with the load. And that's when things are going to take, uh, you know, excessive loading that shouldn't be taking loading. And then also that kind of leads down the arm, right? So if this is lacking mobility, your elbow is going to try to gain mobility to make up for it when it's a joint that shouldn't be. And uh, that's when I'm running into issues in my elbows. And that leads down in the wrist. So it's kind of like this chain leak effect that's been happening, but Justin's been great. So um, we've been doing active release therapy on it, some Graston, and even hooking up the uh, EMS machine, the newbie and working to um, send neurological signals to train the nervous system to fire muscles that aren't firing uh, properly. So that's what's been going on with rehab and through that process, uh, my, my pec's great. Like it's now 100%, um, I'm gonna go into this next mesocycle of training and being able to hit uh, chest fully. So I've had to adapt training around that and um, use that EMS machine, the newbie, during my training to be able to train. Um, I've also been uh, mending my my tendonitis. I have a medial epicondylitis, which is like golfer's elbow, and that's feeling really, really good. So I'm excited about this next training phase because it uh, should be really productive for me. Um, but body weight's been coming up. Uh, a little bit of body fat has come on, but it's, it's just to be expected. And um, I'm coming out the, the tail end of what we're siding on for this, like this push phase and um, my super supplementation has been uh, for about 11 weeks now and so hitting right at this this 240 mark um, I, I ran lab work and kind of based off that deciding if I wanted to continue or not um, everything looks pretty good uh, my LDL does never change throughout the year um, whether I'm in a blast phase or on HRT um, HDL comes down like uh, you know 10 points so that's something to be considerate of uh, my hematocrit is usually something that elevates so I'm in 
will be increasing red blood cell production and um, I will need to donate blood. So that's something just to be mindful of. Um, LFTs trended up slightly, so my ALT, AST, it's really hard for me to say if like if that is just still training related or not um, be, because um, it's still within a range that we've seen in athletes that you can have uh, ALT levels that are five times normal from hard training bouts and that can be elevated for like seven days. So um, that's something to be considered of, but they have trended up over these last one weeks. So it's just time and being at the body weight that I'm at, like, I'll probably just need to like hold here because otherwise they're I just won't make 212. I'll be an open bodybuilder before I know it. Um, so yeah, going into this cruise phase, that's what the plan is now. And uh, going to keep trying to progress training, of course. So that never changes. Like I think one of the biggest things you can do to hold and solidify your progress between your blast phases and your cruise phases is keep the same mindset in your training. And a lot of this is psychological. Someone's saying, oh, I'm going into this, this cruising phase. You think of it as like a maintenance mode, like you can't make progress anymore. And you're not, not training as hard. Um, or maybe you start slipping in other areas as well, like your meals aren't quite right on. And it's, it's easy to remove some of that hypertrophy stimulus that is taking place in your training when you're really, really motivated. And so if you remove that, it's so easy if hormone levels are dropping off and you're removing loading stimulus that you end up dropping off a lot during these cruise phases. And that doesn't have to be the case. Um, I, I have many people that continue to make progress. It's just at a slower rate is usually what it is. So it's, uh, it's, it's so important to continue making training uh, very productive and putting a lot of effort in. The thing that may change is your recovery capacity. So you might need an extra rest day in place or you might need uh, a little bit lower training volume. Uh, so that's just something to be considered of if, if you're going to sessions and you feel super beat up or you are starting to see performance drops, you're probably training with too high of a volume or not giving yourself enough rest days. So that's something to add in. Uh, it's not like just train harder and push harder, bro. No, it's like, <laughs> It is time to pull back in a certain way, but keep putting effort into those sets that you are doing. I'm coming off the, what I ran this past week. I had labs this week. I said this week um, I wanted to do a deload week. Um, I was feeling pretty beat up myself just from progressing loads and getting stronger. And I wanted to go into this next phase feeling really fresh with joints and connective tissue feeling great. So um, this week I reduced my volume slightly, just doing like one to two sets per exercise and uh, keeping like three reps shy of failure. So that's like the big thing is, if you need to feel fresh again, like reduce your loading. If you keep lifting heavy weights, it's gonna be hard for your connective tissue to repair. And then uh, getting close to failure, the neurologic, the CNS fatigue from that, or the systemic fatigue, however you uh, understand that, is uh, what's gonna be uh, really taxed when you do get close to failure and with heavier loads. So reducing that, you can drop off fatigue get fresh again and get ready for your next training session. So that's why I set up my next training cycle. Still gonna run the same split. Uh, you can see that training split below and I'm still gonna do legs once a week and have my push and pull days. I'm just starting with a little bit less volume um, as I've moved a few exercises around. Uh, I, would, you know, I would tell you guys, if you are planning out your training cycles, people ask me all the time, when do you change exercises? And it's like, if you're still getting stronger at a lift, keep it in place. Like there's no reason to change it. Um, well, I would say have enough variety in movement patterns so you don't get overuse injuries occurring. But if you have a lift that is getting really stagnant, now nah, that'd be a good time to change it out. And what I have been finding with myself, at least lately, is about six, seven weeks of hard training is about what I can do before I need to take some type of uh, reduction in volume, deload, and before I can go back into my next training, training phase. So uh, diet-wise, nothing's changing yet. So I'm still, you can see my diet below, everything's posted. And still doing two high days a week of my pull days, which is 700 carbs, 300 protein, about 40 fat. Uh, the exact numbers are down below. Um, my other train days, my push days, my leg days, 500 carbs, same protein, same fats. And my off days will be uh, around 100 grams of carbs and 90 grams of fat. And I like that calorie cycling approach. I feel like it's I've kept really tight doing it, and I still have some like d d pretty deep glute lines, and weight's been nice and slowly progressing. So there's been no reason to make a change of that because it continues to work. So don't think you always need to make these diet changes all the time. I've been on the same diet for for weeks on end now. 
but progress is just continuous. So that's, that's what's been. Uh, as far as cardio goes, I'm still doing five sessions in the morning of 20 minutes on the stairs and I'll, I'll, I'll walk the dogs afterwards just around the block. So <laughs> count, count that in. Once a week, I have been adding in some Bikram yoga, <laughs> which I know that sounds really like in, you know, the way out there in the other side of the spectrum for, for what I do. But going through this rehab and, and prehab process and thinking about mobility uh, and just doing something different, you know, something that Renee and I can get out and just have a different experience. We want to do yoga, so we think we can, can gain some mobility out of it, which uh, you're getting into good like movement patterns and, and, and movements that you never get into and, and areas where you normally get injured in, like picking up something and twisting and grabbing it, and you end up hurting yourself that way. So. In, in, in yoga, you're going through all those positions and building strength in those in ranges where you could be susceptible to injury. So um, it's been great and I really do enjoy it. Um, it's, it is hot yoga, so it's not the one I go to. It's not official Bikram, which uh, I guess it's a very set standards on, on what they mean for Bikram. But uh, just room's hot. So I, I think it's a good addition just to help the muscle be more pliable and going in and usually I'll wake up pretty tight the next day so I do it on my off days so something else that that I've added in but um, all other variables have been pretty consistent like sleep still like seven and a half to eight hours a night and um, that that's been been quality all the time so but uh, that's uh, I think it covers all the variables of what I've been changing and so we're gonna run this out for the next few weeks and I'll I'll update y'all on, on any changes that we that we do make, but big things just you know over while I'm in this cruising phase, just watching body composition, my pictures, and, and making sure that I do stay tight. I think that's a, a big thing because it's easy to like watch the scale and try to maintain that weight that you got up to, and you end up trying to change in composition a little bit and getting a little softer. Um, so you might need to pull back food. So big things is watching pictures. So uh, that's that's my update, guys. Um, let's get into training. So today was a pool session for me. first pull session that I programmed for this mesocycle and um, one movement that I've really liked for the day is starting with the Smith Machine bent over barbell row and I've seen a few guys do these and I haven't done a, just a bent over row in a long time because I wanted a lot of chest braced movements in my in my training because I have like I had rack pulls in and I pulled rack pulls out because I just felt like I wasn't it was it was so taxing in my my lower back in a negative way that it was it just wasn't productive for me so I pulled those out but I said I still want some lower back loading in the spot for spinal erectors um, and I gave the Smith machine um, barbell rows a chance and I'd tell you like for a first movement like it just lights up my entire back like I think that is part of what could make a good exercise selection like if you just feel your your the muscle you want get full of blood and feel a good contraction, like that's probably a good movement you should be having in your in your plan. If you want, like, man, I don't even feel anything moving. I don't feel what's contracting. Like, um, there might be some questions that go into that, but possibly this might not be a good move for you. If you know something else, you feel much better. So, with that uh, Smith Machine barbell row. Um, I use a block just to, so I can get a big enough full range of motion, but I really try to lock in my torso and not have a lot of swing. It's going to happen though, like if you're uh, moving weight and to slow it down, like you're going to have some, uh, some, some movement in your torso. And so just with this one, I'm just trying to drive my elbows back, keep the wrists and elbow in line, uh, using a, a pronated grip. Uh, I feel like it, it kind of keeps some of the loading off like the actual bicep itself. And um, keep the abdomen and torso contracted. Want to, want to have like I don't want to like really arch my lower back, just more uh, a neutral spine and drive the elbows 
elbows back. You don't need to drive the elbows past the torso, just to the torso, and that's when you're gonna hit a lot of lat, and so that's the emphasis of what I'm trying to do here is hit lat. So first set I worked up to was a hard set of 10 reps, then I backed down the load, and I think I ended up hitting like 17 reps with the lighter weight. So still doing a top set and a back off set. So moving on from there, um, I, I think it's great to start a movement in the shortened phase for lats because you can get that really good mind-muscle connection and then move into a pull-down movement where you really stretch and lengthen out the lat. You have that full of blood, so you can stretch it out and you get a better mind-muscle connection with it. Uh, and uh, what I do is I was using a, uh, like a, a wide grip straight bar for a pull-down. Uh, I've switched to using the prime bar with D-handles. And the actual prime grips how you like kind of loop your palm onto them and just your kind of fingertip them that just ruined my my forearms as far as my golfer elbow um, inflammation was concerned so I need something that I can grip and keep my wrist neutral and uh, also I can just load it so much more I have much more grip strength like this than trying to palm something so using the D handles I set them up pretty wide to where I am wider than my shoulder width and driving the elbows just down towards the hip, not trying to really intentionally uh, tuck the elbow in and uh, an abduct, because I do want to hit with this movement more like Terry's major, more upper lat fibers, and then those lower trap fibers. So that's kind of my thought process on there. And you know, talking with Vu about where we want to build size, it was really kind of like in that upper lat uh, Terry's area where we can get that bigger V taper. Um, so that was a rationale for putting that into the program there. Um, same process as far as set goes. My first work set was 10 to 12. I backed off in weight to hit around 15 reps. Then moving forward from there, um, you know, I want to move into something that will hit some of my upper back. And what I really do like is dumbbell prone rows. So lay chest down on a slight incline bench. And uh, if you can get this pretty flat, that would actually be probably more ideal. Um, but the idea here is just keeping the elbows flared out and you're just really focusing on moving the scapulas from retraction to protraction. That's going to hit all those mid, mid trap fibers, some getting in slightly into the upper fibers and then driving the elbows back up high. And that of course hit, hit a lot of rear delt, bringing that into play. So that, that whole yoke across your back from like, if you're like laying flat, you just think like from like traps all the way out to your rear delts, like that whole thickness can be built with that movement. And um, I do like them chest supported because it really takes away any swing. You see my legs are like way extended back because I, I can't get any drive out of my spinal erectors that way. So it makes the movement very, very strict and uh, you get a great contraction in your traps doing it that way. So I'll, I'll do a set of six to 10 for my ter first top set, back down in weight and hit something above 10 reps, 10 to 15 reps. And then from there, I wanna move back into another uh, vertical pulling movement. So if you notice, this is kind of how I structure my pull days. It's like a, a horizontal pull, vertical pull, horizontal pull, vertical pull. So you can have some good balance and development. And what I wanted to do was a uh, unilateral vertical pull and because I, I do think you kind of limit yourself by doing bilateral like two, using two hands to row because the lat does assist some in, uh, in, in going into horizontal like spinal flexion like bringing the, the torso down like you're going to contract your oblique. Um, you don't want to over exaggerate that but that is how you would fully shorten the lat bringing that humerus closer to the back part of the tailbone. So using a hammer strength high row, um, you can really do this. And I, I do use a supinated grip, which um, you will have a lot of bicep involvement. And so this is kind of a secondary thought is like, hey, if your biceps are really terrible, um, you could use more supinated work for your rowing movements, like start your pull day with a supinated barbell row because it's gonna bring more biceps in and that way you get more bicep volume in place. Just another thought. but. Um, with this movement, it's really the only way I can grab this handle, so that's why I'm grabbing it that way. Uh, I do it single arm so I can really focus on driving that elbow close to the body. And the closer you get your elbow to the body in a row, you can really start engaging more of the uh, lower lat fibers. And I want you to think too, like as you're extending up, 
you're trying to wrap your scapula around your back and extend it around and that's how the lat really will fully get lengthened and that's about the state for the fully lengthened lat it's not up here the lats kind of gets disengaged and shortened the fully extended lat is is right about at that angle out in front of you with the scapulas protracted around and then you can drive that hip down not focusing on moving the scapula down but just driving that elbow down to the hip and trying to almost wrap it around the back and uh, you can get a super strong contraction this way but I do uh, still uh, to my top set of 6 to 10 reps and then I do a back off set of 12 to 15 and that uh, wraps up the main compound moves that I do for the day and then I, what I do is go into an isolation movement so I want to hit something isolated for the lats, something higher rep and what I've grown fond of is doing a uh, single arm lat standing cable pullover. And I use an ankle cuff just to take my hand out of it to kind of alleviate some of my uh, forearm tendonitis. And same thought process is I'm trying to wrap that scapula around my back and really lengthen the lat. And what I want to see is that cable, when that cable comes down, it hits 90 degrees with my wrist when my arm is fully extended out. And that's why you're going to load the lat with the most tension when it's fully lengthened. So just a little bit different loading pattern. We've already done a lot of loading like in the shortened phase, so it's a good way to, to load it when, it's, when it is lengthened. And then as you're pulling back, your lever arm becomes shorter, or the cable angle becomes smaller, and you get less resistance. Like you'll feel it when you come down, the cable's almost in line with your arm, so you're not really loading the shortened phase that much. So the resistance profile matches the strength curve really, really well. But it's, it's, it's great just to hit like two sets of 15 to 20 reps and, and like really drive like metabolic stress and work on that aspect for hypertrophy. So then moving from there, I go into like a rear pec deck fly, hit, want to hit some work for, for rear delts. I just start with two sets um, as I'll build up volume as I, as I see they're recovering okay, uh, hitting like 15 to 20 reps for two sets. Then from there, we go into bicep work. And so with bicep programming, you won't need as much volume if you are doing a lot of back rows, especially if you're doing a lot of back rows that are supinated. So I don't have a lot in place. I do two sets of a standing dumbbell curl, which has a, a slight uh, supination that I'm doing. Uh, I don't go full on neutral grip to supinated grip. It's kind of something between and uh, just do like a, I keep the reps higher because I do so much heavy loading on my back rows so they do get some heavy uh, high tension stimulus so and just uh, I usually will flare up my my forearms just with doing going too heavy on bicep training so um, think more pump <laughs> uh, doing like 15 to 20 reps for two sets is what I aim for for my bicep curls then I want to hit something for my uh, brachioradialis and brachialis and like forearm area. So I do a uh, wrist curl or reverse wrist curl on the cables. So I have the cable pulling back behind me. And to start the movement, I go from wrist flexion to wrist extension. So I contract all these extensors in the forearm. Then I can curl up and shorten the brachioradialis, the brachialis, get full contraction and everything, then go back down and fully lengthen out all those muscle groups. So I think it's a great way to get a good strength profile and resistance profile using that cable coming behind you. And that, this was back from like what Dante Trudell came out with for DC training. Maybe someone came out with it before, but at least that's where I, I saw it at. Um, but anyway, like doing like a standing reverse curl, like you don't get a lot of tension at the bottom, it's just at the top. So with this one, you get good tension right away off the bottom and it carries out throughout the top. And uh, I, th I think it does work, still work better with like higher rep ranges. So like doing two sets of 12 to 20 reps is going to be a better area for the forearms and, and breaker radialis to respond with. Otherwise, you're going to really just beat up and get a lot of overuse uh, injuries. So... That wraps up my, my pull day. Um, you can see it. I have it listed below the full workout so you guys can, can look at how I programmed it and, and see. And maybe off the rationale that I'm giving for you, you can think about how you would want to program your pull day and what you need to emphasize. So if it's, you know, I always bring this up. Like if 
If you have great lats and no traps, then it doesn't make sense to just train all your lats first. Go train traps first. Uh, or if you need more like upper lat, like focus on a movement that hits that better for you. Um, don't think you need to do a bar Smith barbell row because John does a Smith barbell row if you don't feel anything off of it. Pick the movement that works for you, that's biomechanically right for you, and those will be the best movements you can really make a lot of progress on. So anyway, guys, I always appreciate you tuning in and listening. Uh, list below if you have any questions. I'd be happy to answer those. And uh, stay tuned to the channel, and we'll talk to you guys next time.